Thank you, everyone. Uh, Marta Hatzel, uh, Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering. And so like a lot of the other common um, uh, presentations, uh, we were tasked with the goal of synthesizing what's going on across campus. And so I'll be presenting, um, I have three goals, basically. One is to talk a little bit about what green analysis is. Also talk a little bit about what um, hard to abate industries means, and then um, highlight what is going on at Georgia Tech across campus in this space. And then selfishly, I will also try to plug some of the stuff that my research group is working on currently. Um, so with that, uh, you know, you've he heard a lot of, um, you know, talks thus far about energy um, and sustainability. And so you might already know a lot about this, but um, and if you're working in industry or you're working at Georgia Tech or you're working in government, um, you are constantly hearing about this path to net zero. Um, and the general goal is that we know that climate, is, uh, climate change is occurring and then it's affecting our day-to-day -day lives. Last week, actually, I was at a very similar symposium for Materials Institute at Princeton University. Uh, and one of my panelists came from California, and he said he really understands the, the effects of climate change when, because he's had to evacuate his home two, three times a year due to forest fires, right? Here in Atlanta, we're getting, you know, increasing rain and floods, which sometimes we can dismiss, but they are increasing uh, the effects of climate change. And so to avoid the worst risks associated with climate change, we're going to have to cut greenhouse gases by half by 2030. So that's coming up. Um, and then we'll have to get to net zero by 2050. And so you have all probably seen um, these uh, diagrams here where we have on the y-axis gigatons of CO2. Uh, on the x-axis, you have years. And it has a breakdown of the carbon emissions by industry. Um, so you have this blue region here is the power industry. Uh, this orange or area here is industry. This purple area here is transportation. Uh, and then this green area here is buildings. So when you look at this graph, the first thing you see is that buildings is actually the lowest carbon emissions. So that's good. We still need to improve it, but it's the lowest. And then what you see is the distribution among uh, power, industry, and transportation is pretty evenly dispersed, meaning that we have to make efforts in all three sectors to get to the half point and then also to the net zero point. Uh, another takeaway is the first sector to cross zero is power. Um, this is not surprising if you were listening to the previous speakers because we see rapid growth in renewables and, and, and rapid deployment and costs being driven down. And so this is a great thing. Um, this is the, you can see the um, amount of solar and wind is going up exponentially and the prices are coming down. And with Juan Pablo's perovskites, that's gonna continue to meet that trend. And so power industry is not an industry that's hard to abate. We kind of have pathways forward in that space. Um, but what you can see is this industry and in transportation sectors, no matter how far you move along here, that deviation kind of stays the same. And that's kind of indicating these are our hard to abate industries. We don't have technologies or solutions today that can be implemented to quickly get us to that net zero. Um, actually, if you listen to Gleb's talk earlier, uh, transportation is partially solved. We can do ground transportation and projections suggest that 30% of our electric vehicle sales in 2030 are going to be electric. Um, if you see here, we, we need it to be higher. We need it to be 60%. Um, but aviation, air travel, that's where we're gonna, that's where our transportation sector is gonna have issues. Um, but today, I just really wanna focus you, uh, you on, on this hard to industrial sector and kind of highlight um, the role catalysis is going to play in trying to meet some of these needs. Um, so with that, 35% um, of the global emissions today comes from making iron, steel, green of cement, making chemicals such as fertilizers and thermoplastics. That's a lot of carbon emissions. Um, and why is that the case? Well, we need to use process heat 
for all of those industries. Um, and we need to get to temperatures above 1,000 degrees Celsius to calcine limestone, reduce iron, or steam crack hydrocarbons that are, and hydrocarbons are essential for nearly all of our commodity chemicals and plastics and fertilizers and so forth. Um, so that's a lot of boilers that require a lot of fossil fuels to create that heat to run those processes. Not to mention that I don't see Elon Musk getting into cement anytime soon because it's a low margin process, right? There's not much um, value that you can get there. So when we in academia come up with the best new zero carbon cement device, it's not necessarily going to get implemented because it's low margin. So industry is really challenging and these hard to abate industries are really challenging both from just a carbon per footprint, but also economically. Um, and so, but I, from that perspective, I like hard problems. And so it's kind of an exciting area to be working. Um, so let's talk ag again about circular economies. We can make a dent in that carbon emissions by going to circularity. Um, so we talk talked about circular polymers. We can actually recycle cements. We can recycle steel. We can recycle even chemicals. And that in, in itself can help us with reduce emissions by 40%. So that's a starting point, but that's not 100%. So that maybe gets us to 2030, but how do we get to 2050? Um, really, it's gonna be energy efficiency. Hey, it's not a surprise. You're gonna need to reduce the energy consumption by 15 to 20%. So by implementing uh, a 40% savings well, by circularity, and then also improving energy efficiency, efficiency of processes, we can get to that net zero in industry. And so what I'm gonna talk about here next is what are we doing at Georgia Tech to try to focus on this 15 to 20% efficiency that's needed in industrial processes. Um, so my talk is not focused on separations. My research group does focus, our, we're kind of divided into two areas, sustainable separations and sustainable catalysis. And I'm gonna focus most of this talk on the catalysis side, but, Separations are gonna be critical for all industrial processes. Aconcha did a really nice job of identifying the importance of separations for desalination, um, but we, we use separations for everything from our, our refining of our petrochemicals to our separations for our pharmaceuticals. Um, and so with all of those separation devices, historically, again, we've relied on process heat. Uh, and at Georgia Tech, we have, I think, some of the world's best separation scientists working on all of these problems. And Ryan Lively and Dave Scholl are two of these engineers who have worked on this. Um, Ryan is actually the director of a DOE-sponsored EFRC, which is a center uh, focused on basically sustainable separations. And what they've charged the field of separations to do is rethink how you use process heat to distill and fractionate these mixtures and transform those processes into ones that can focus on membranes and adsorbents. When we move to membranes, we can completely eliminate the need for any thermal separations. When moving to adsorbents, we can think about how to regenerate with less, much lower temperatures than the 100 degrees Celsius that is required. And so they published this really nice paper in uh, 2016, which really broke this energy problem down. And I think it has really started a revolution in terms of industrial separations and a movement towards developing all these materials that can perform these separations. And so there's a lot of work in material science focused on designing these membranes for the various applications. Lots of startup companies coming out now uh, because one of the major benefits with material science is you can tune at the atomic and molecular scale and get precision separations that aren't achievable just by fractionating based off of boiling temperature of mixtures. And so this has been opened up a huge avenue, both in academic research, but also in industrial um, uh, companies and, uh, and some growing area. Uh, but I believe that in order to get to that 10 to 15% energy um, reduction, separations are gonna be important. I also just wanna highlight Ryan's center, which he's running right now. Uh, Krista Walton, who I think will be introducing the speaker, also was the head before Ryan took over. Uh, and these are their general areas that they focus on within their center. And they've been a center for about eight years. So very successful group. 
Um, another uh, researcher that I just wanted to highlight that also works into the separations is Shankar Nair. He's also in chemical engineering, uh, and he's done a lot of work in uh, both looking at novel materials like graphene oxide and re uh, reduced graphene oxide for these membrane-based processes. Uh, he's worked with uh, in various industries from uh, the paper and pulp industry uh, and transitioning them away from thermal separations and recently published uh, a really notable work in the journal Science, which is the first demonstration of a synthesis um, of a quasi-1D hierarchical zeolites. Zeolites are these really porous materials that have controlled structures. Having controlled structures and microporosity can allow for really unprecedented degrees of selectivity, permeability for separations, but they also allow for new degrees for environment to perform catalysis in. And so Shankar's work has really crossed over between separation science and catalysis science for low energy industrial processes. Um, so here's, now I'm gonna switch gears towards um, the uh, catalysis side. Um, and uh, I can't highlight all the researchers across campus and I probably have also admittedly left a few people off this list and I apologize in advance. But I think what I want you to take away from this diagram is that we have a tremendous amount of world-class researchers in catalysis science at Georgia Tech. They cross over all, every discipline from material science, to chemical engineering, chemistry, biomolecular, uh, uh, chemical engineering, biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering. And uh, we also investigate all aspects of catalysis science from looking at advanced characterization of materials to material synthesis, to uh, modeling and simulation, uh, to process engineering. And so um, this has created many different collaborations, which I can highlight because of the uh, brevity of this. Um, but here is an example of just some of the uh, catalysis scientists that we have across campus. Uh, below each of their names, I, I, I have their departments. And below that, I also have kind of what I think is maybe their primary expertise, but we, we do, we have a lot of traditional catalysis scientists who focus on thermal catalysis, uh, but we have a lot of emerging scientists who work in the area of electron-driven catalysis or electric catalysis, um, and also um, photon-based catalysis. Um, so with that, um, I, I alluded to, we have a lot of people working in electric catalysis, and that's because of this uh, driving down the cost of electricity. So as we've, as we've increased the amount of renewable energy, the cost or levelized cost of electricity has been driven down, which has enabled us to sometimes say to ourselves, oh, electricity is almost free, which is not accurate. Electricity will always have costs associated with it, um, but it's driven down to the point where we can use it in more unique and creative ways than, we, than would have been cost prohibitive in the past. And so when looking at sustainable green catalysis, we really want to make sure that we're using those grid, those renewable electrons. If I pull electricity from the grid that's from coal and I perform catalysis with it, it's just as bad as if I have a, a fossil fuel-based boiler. So, uh, so in order for it to be green, we have to make sure we're using renewable sources. And so the most direct way to use that is to use um, electrocatalysis where you have bring that electron in and you have a charge transfer reaction occur and interact with a molecule that you're interested in, either performing a bond breaking or bond forming reaction. Um, there's also uh, photoelectrocatalysis and mechanocatalysis, which also can directly use those electrons uh, to uh, perform these types of reactions. Um, there's also ways to indirectly use renewable electrons to make sure that you're getting green catalysis. Um, and that is through dual heating. Akancha also did a really nice job of highlighting we need more work done in renewable heat production um, because electricity just by itself is not gonna be the most useful form of energy in all aspects. Um, and so if you can use electrons to make heat in the form of dual heating and then perform your thermal catalysis, that's also very important. And so I think we're gonna see a lot of changes in just design of reactors that can create these uniform heating methods driven by electricity. Uh, and then biocatalysis is another indirect form because you can use electrons to perhaps grow, um, to create products like acetate to feed to microorganisms, and then the microorganisms can uh, generate whatever product that you might find desirable. Uh, and then again, you can use directly solar with no conversion process through a process called photocatalysis. Um, and so now I'll launch into kind of just giving a very brief overview of a few of our researchers. Um, essentially, uh, Car 
Carson Sievers is a, a professor in chemical and biomolecular engineering. He actually uh, did a postdoc with Chris Jones before joining the faculty. Um, and he is one of the leading pioneers of this field called mechanocatalysis. And mechanocatalysis is essentially just a mill that you shake and you have a catalyst in there. And because of the interactions between those uh, catalysts, that you create regions of local hotspots. And those local hotspots can have very high temperatures um, and can allow for that, that temperature with that catalyst to break that bond that you find. Um, so he's been doing a lot, quite a lot of work in using this process to depolymerize lignin to create compounds of interest from a bioresource. Um, but in a um, collaboration that I've been that, that I've been able to work with him on, uh, he and Caroline, a PhD student, have been looking at how you can create ammonia uh, from these processes. And if you stick around till tomorrow, uh, Caroline will be giving a talk specifically on this project. Uh, but it's a really fascinating project where they're taking a catalyst using a ball mill and with nitrogen they're able to split the triple bond of nitrogen uh, form a nitride and then hydrogenate it to actually make ammonia and so um, she'll be giving that talk uh, tomorrow uh, we also have um, Faisal and Sung Soon who come from the Department of Material Science and Engineering um, they have a long-standing collaboration working on various electrocatalytic reactions for fuel cells and electrolysis cells. Um, here I've highlighted one of their more recent collaborations where they looked at epitaxial monolayers of platinum and interactions with graphene, and they were able to get really unprecedented degrees of stability. When we move towards these electrocatalytic systems, the cost of the system is going to be directly tied to the stability of these catalysts and how long they can last. And so uh, being able to develop and understand at a mechanistic level um, how you can orient the materials so that they can be stable and operate for a long time is really important. And so uh, through coupling theory, advanced characterization, and experiments, they were able to really show um, the origins of this stability um, was due to this platinum uh, carbon covalent bond. And so Faisal also will be giving a talk tomorrow on uh, some of these advanced characterization techniques that his group uh, has pioneered at Georgia Tech. Um, Sung Woo Lee, um, he's one of my collaborators within the mechanical engineering department. Uh, hydrogen is also going to be very critical in many, uh, in many industries going forward. And this is one of his more recent work focused on designing electrocatalysts for hydrogen production. Uh, specifically, he took cotton. Uh, which is very abundantly available, uh, and developed a way to electrodeposit non-precious metal, nickel, and iron-based catalysts onto this copper, uh, and then could, uh, and then he was able to uh, get rid of the cotton and, and have this really highly porous electrode made from just um, nickel and iron. And he was able to show that at an extremely low um, in our fields, we did we demonstrate a good catalyst is one that has low over potential or energetic losses. And so he was able to demonstrate that not only was this a large area, high surface area electrode for splitting water um, made of non-precious metals, um, but that it also was able to have a really exquisite uh, performance in terms of um, energetic losses. Um, Mei-Ling Liu is also um, a pioneer in the area of reversible electrochemical cells. Ideally, you, it would be nice to have a fuel cell um, and an electrolytic cell side by side. So you could basically create hydrogen when you need energy to be stored, and then you could burn that hydrogen through a fuel cell in an efficient way when you need energy. And so being able to operate um, energy storage and energy conversion intermittently is really important for renewable energy. Right now, we don't have fuel cells that can operate in one mode because we don't have catalysts that are durable operating as both anodic and cathodic catalysts. And so Maylin has been developing some of these catalysts, again, using low precious metals or non-precious metals, and specifically has been focusing on uh, intermediate temperature-based solid electrolyte fuel cells. Um, and this is one of his more recent publications in this area um, but again, this is a really important thing to be able to couple energy storage, hydrogen generation with energy conversion fuel cells. And um, this is a very promising new direction. Uh, and then I wanted to highlight one of our theorists, A.J. Medford. He's uh, an assistant professor in chemical and biomolecular engineering, but he has an expertise in understanding um, through theory how reactions occur on surfaces. 
Uh, but he also has expertise in mach machine learning and uncertainty quantification. As we design new catalysts to perform new reactions like, to decarbonize industry, you can't just go into the lab and do one material at a time because that would take an infinite amount of time. And so what AJ does is he uses machine learning to help guide experiments and point us in the right direction on what are viable candidates for certain reactions. And so I'll just end quickly by just sharing a little bit about my research group. Um, my group is in mechanical engineering and we really are motivated by how to use renewable electrons. And typically we're looking at how you can electrify processes in sustainable ways. And we work in the area of separation science, catalysis science, water treatment, and energy conversion processes. Um, I've been benefit, I've benefited from a very multidisciplinary research group with students in chemistry, chemical, chemical engineering, and environmental engineering. And I think that's really helped accelerate our research. Um, but what gets me excited every day and coming to work is really this graph here which is that um, there's a lot that needs to be done in the industry, but what really excites me is that how can we decarbonize these two chemicals, ammonia and ethylene, because they are the largest carbon emitters of any chemical that we make globally, um, with their footprint being each over 300 um, metric tons of CO2 per year just to make these two chemicals. Um, they're essential for everything we do, from our plastics to our food. Uh, nearly all the nitrogen that's in your body comes from ammonia that's manufactured um, through this process. And so what we're trying to do is develop these green catalysts for ammonia production. And we're looking at how you can do this at ambient temperature and ambient pressure, and specifically trying to unravel how, when we lower the temperature, um, these different crystalline phases um, uh, affect our, our transformations. We're also looking at how you can use our uh, more abundant feedstocks instead of, um, or uh, feedstocks such as that are easier to activate, such as nitrate over nitrogen. Uh, and to do this, we use electrochemistry and electrodeposition to do controlled material synthesis to allow us to get certain active sites to accelerate our catalyst. Um, we've also been trying to demonstrate with alloys how to create long, durable, and low precious metal catalysts. Um, We've been able to demonstrate that with um, disordered uh, copper and palladium, we get very variable product distributions, uh, but through creating these very highly uh, uh, ordered uh, alloys that we can get really stable performance over um, hundreds of hours uh, for ammonia production. And then the second thing that I'm really interested in is, is combining reaction and separations for carbon capture and sequestration. Right now we capture carbon dioxide and we don't know what to do with it. It doesn't make sense to do carbon capture unless you can do something with CO2. And so what we're looking at is actually combining capture technologies that take CO2 out of the atmosphere, convert it into an aqueous phase bicarbonate, and looking at doing bicarbonate-based catalysis to uh, make products. Um, and specifically, we've been trying uh, to make products like ethylene um, through this electrocatalytic process. Um, and we're still quite low, um, but we're reaching a 10% conversion efficiency. That means that 10% of our electrons go directly to making um, ethylene. Actually, right now, we're mostly making carbon monoxide, but this still right now is the highest um, that has been demonstrated in literature. And so we think that we can make advances, especially through tuning the catalyst to get higher selectivity for ethylene. And so with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, my funding agencies and uh, my students, and I'm happy to answer a question before the break.